Now we can move to uh, our next speaker, who is also our final speaker for this session today. And uh, this uh, particular award, uh, the AEL McNaughton Award, is uh, the most prestigious award that IEEE Canada gives. Um, it is given this year to Dr. Robert Hanna uh, for contributions to industry at large uh, at large, and to the electrical engineering profession. He has worked um, internationally, he's done work around the world uh, in many different technical areas. Uh, so it'll be interesting to hear from him um, and uh, he's also a pr another previous uh, IEEE Canada President Region 7 Director for IEEE. So he's also got uh, significant uh, volunteer experience that he has used to uh, help others as well. So let's, we can now move into the talk from Bob Hanna. If I can find it. There it is. Yes. And this, this uh, by the way, this lecture um, is is the McNaughton lecture, and it is given at the CCECE conference generally as part of the conference. But we elected today to put it into this session with the award winner. So go ahead, Bob. I don't mind if you saw my picture, Celia. I asked no, but I have that camera on me, so I don't know if you can do that. If not, I will continue. I will start my video. Oh, never mind. Do you hear me? For some reason. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, I can, I can move on then. I was jealous of Dr. Rashid, so I went and put a jacket and a tie and you can <laughs> see. <laughs> anyway. Um, first of all, um, I want to thank you, Celia, personally, and the award committee, and of course the conference committee. I know it's, uh, it's quite a challenge for the conference committee to be running this conference virtually, um, as well as I'd like to congratulate uh, my previous colleagues for their award, and in particular Dr. Amin, who, who, Dr. Amir, who was very kind with his remarks. Uh, when we volunteer within the IEEE, we really consider ourselves as a small family. We learn from each other, we help each other, and we are there for each other. So I joined IEEE in 1974, and I'm still a member. So I should tell you the number of years that I have worked for this amazing organization. The McNaughton Lecture, as Celia said, by its virtue is a technical one. And I was, I was sort of really debating, sort of trying to understand the people who will be listening to myself to make it less technical, to pick a subject that is of a common interest uh, to those who are listening to me. And I thought of this title, which we call it Power Quality Challenges in Industry. The reason I selected this topic, because this, I was faced with this topic when I started engineering, practicing engineering in early 1980s. And believe it or not, it's still relevant to date. Just to give you a sense of my sort of overall interest in electrical engineering field is one area of interest is what we call it, application of medium voltage adjustable speed drives, I have conducted several complex uh, large equipment failure analysis, uh, as well as uh, more recently, I've been working on electric storage facilities. Um, this is an outline of my presentation that I thought I share with you here. And these are the areas I'll be covering in brief. And uh, at the end, I'd like to make some suggestions to this presentation, some suggestions for future R&D work that's really geared towards postgraduate students since this, this conference, most of the attendees are of university background. I thought I'd give them a couple of suggestions here if they want to take it up. Next slide, please. 
Now then, power quality issues, they cover these areas. One of them you're gonna hear me most of the time, I will focus on is called voltage sags and swell. Sags mean when your supply voltage to your equipment drops, swells mean when it increases. The second type is when we talk about two type of interruption. One, we call it momentary, which means the power has interrupted and automatically came back. When we talk about extended power interruption, when you lose the power to your residence, to the factory, whatever, and it doesn't come back. The other area of interest here is harmonic distortion, which we will talk about it and its impact on operation of equipment, grounding, over voltage transients. But because of the limitation and the time here, I thought I will focus on the first two, the voltage sag and harmonics. The reason is these in our industry are considered the most problematic. And these are the one that gives us as engineer hard burns and business, by the way. Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, power quality. The way IEEE standard 1100 defines it, it says it is the concept of powering and grounding sensitive equipment in a manner that is suitable to the operation of that equipment. Let me put it in a much simpler way. Electrical equipment are designed to properly operate within certain voltage supply deviation tolerances. And this is typically plus minus 10% and over a certain duration. The closest most of us have experienced when we talk about power quality issue, say during a thunderstorm, when we notice our house light flickering, when we notice suddenly the TV screen or the computer monitor going off and coming on. We consider these events nuisance as a homeowners, but when it comes to the, our industry, and large commercial facility, they tend to cause quite a bit of havoc when it comes to their services. And in some cases, the results and loss of revenues. What matters when we talk about these voltage disturbances is really, it's not just the magnitude of these, uh, the drop in these voltages, it's the duration. What is interesting, I want to say right at the outset of this presentation, when we talk about duration of a specific electrical disturbance, we're talking about less than one second. Let's be very clear, less than one second. So you blink your eye, that's one second almost. So, so this is the area that we need to work and, and come up with a very specialized electrical equipment to protect these critical load. Next slide, please. Now, I thought I share with you here a, a, a sample of a, a sort of a menu of the electrical equipment that are used in the industry and they are readily impacted by power quality. Adjustable speed rise, uninterruptible power supply, we refer to it as UPS soft starter. Data control center is the one that is the most sensitive, like, you know, where the banks, most of them have, in fact, all of them have data processing to sort of do handle all their transaction. Now, what is common in all these points here, what is common in them is that they all use electronic switching devices. That's the most common element in them, which means they might be using diodes, IGBTs, IGCTs, et cetera. And the reason they use it, because their, some of their basic requirement is uh, as the speaker before me talked about the DC and the AC inverters, is that we convert AC to DC and DC to AC. This conversion required to use these electronic devices, and these electronic devices are very, very sub, uh, sensitive to voltage fluctuation. Next slide, please. Now, what is a voltage sign? Voltage sag have been identified as being single most expensive power quality event. That's why I have focused my presentation on the voltage sag. There are so many publications within IEEE and standards that I will give you a sample at the end that you can read more if you're interested that cover the subject uh, 
uh, voltage sack. Typically speaking, a voltage sack could occur in an industrial plant, commercial places, on average twice a month. So you could be faced with these voltage sacks about 24 times a year. Remember, each one of these sacks potentially could cause a system upset if we did not have the proper, what we call the medication equipment. The reason the last bullet point, I have it in blue to emphasize, unfortunately, voltage sacks are fact of life and cannot readily be eliminated from regular utility. So it's something it has been here, as I said, in the early 80s. And I'm going to show you later on a slide that I just captured last month to show you a severe uh, voltage disturbance. Next slide, please. What is a voltage sag? Basically, when, when, you, when the supply voltage at the facility drops below uh, uh, between 10% to 90% of its rated value, meaning if, say, at home, uh, over a window of uh, 0.5 cycle, which is about 8 millisecond to 1 minute, typically, as I have indicated, these durations that are problematic is less than 1 second. That's the area we're talking about. And I can show you in, in other slides, uh, most of them are in the order of, in fact, 200 milliseconds. Voltage sag, the defini other definition, is a sudden voltage drop while the load remain uh, connected to the supply. Next slide, please. There are measurements that will provide us at a plant the value of the voltage sags. Uh, the definition, the, the way the voltage sags is, is, is reported, sometimes is reported as a percentage of the nominal voltage, meaning the value of the remaining voltage, and that's the way IEEE reported. But based on my field experience, some end users could, could report it as the voltage drop itself rather than the remaining voltage. Regardless, um, uh, whether it's the remaining voltage or the under voltage, this is what plants could experience 30, 40, 50% voltage drops. Next slide, please. This to give you an indication that US estimate of industrial cost is in the multi-billion per year. Really, the reason is this mostly when some of these very severe events uh, during uh, thunderstorms, heavy wind, and so on, takes place is the plant could lose its loss of production. And if it was a data processing center, from my experience, if you lose power, you might lose power for one second, but it could take them several hours to restore that, that, that operation or that service, uh, what we call it before pre-disturbance. Next slide, please. Thank you, Celia. This is a, a, a chart that was produced by IEEE standard and by APRI organization in the state. Um, I want you to sort of look at this area from zero to 0 0.2. 0 0.2 is second. In other words, look at the duration. Most of these events that were recorded, they sort of fall into this area, zero to 200 millisecond. And as far as the voltage drop, the more severe the shorter the duration, the more severe, because you would expect, or one would expect that these, these events, when they take place, is mostly uh, widespread on what we call them high tension lines, and the protective equipment there are, are, they operate very, very fast, typically in about three to four cycles, which is six, uh, 60 to about 80 milliseconds. This graph was developed years ago by the computer guys. More or less, um, uh, more or less what, it, what it shows is that if you look in the zone where it starts from mic on the x-axis, where it starts from one microsecond, I don't think you can see my mouse. Can you see my mouse? Not really, no. If you see the x-axis from one microsecond to about um, 20 milliseconds, that red one, basically what this is telling us when there is an event, if it is between these red uh, horizontal line to the left, 
that equipment supposedly is, 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 is able to operate and continue functioning. But if that event results in voltage drop to the right of my chart here, to the right and, and, and below it, then that equipment might malfunction uh, here. Next slide, please. Now, next slide, please. Oh, thank you. If you remember in one of my slides, I said this is something we have to live with. Really, these are the causes of voltage sags. You can see bad weather. Well, I'm afraid we cannot do much about bad weather, meaning thunderstorm, high wind. And most of our transmission lines, if not all, is overhead. So it's very susceptible to snow, uh, ice, wind. So when these lines uh, get impacted and, and they touch each other, they cause what we call them a fault. And that specific fault before the utility protection is activated, which as I said, typically we're talking about a 100 millisecond window, it causes a voltage drop, that's the sag it causes. So it's something, it's out there. Equipment failure is not uncommon. Human error. Sometimes maintenance people could be operating at the utility hub, a substation and cause a, a, cause a, a problem and which results. Animals and birds, it's one of the most common one where animal gets in, uh, into the electrical room and they, they, they I don't know, they, they eat the insulation, whatever, and, and, and they cause these failures. Car accident, I thought I'd share this picture with you. Car trucks, you hear sometimes car trucks hitting a, a pole and causing that flashover. This flash will result in voltage sags. Sometimes these events are internal to that particular industrial plant, like what we call it electrical fault within their switch gear, large motor starting and switching. Next slide, please. What I felt is to put a face to these voltage sags, over the years I have accumulated quite a library of field measurements that represent voltage sags that I thought I'd just share it with you today so that you can get a sense of what I'm talking about. And in brief, I will describe some of these events and their impact uh, on, the, uh, on the, what you call it, the, the end users. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. This one is really, um, uh, this one it shows, just look at this one. This is an event where the, when the waveform shrank, when it shrinks, basically we have a voltage sag. Here it was about 50%. This event was caused by a fault on what we call a 230 kV overhead lines. And this event only lasted four cycles, which is 66 milliseconds. I was monitoring at this data processing center. Unfortunately, this event, which is so, so short, it caused the data processing center to crash. The reason is this data processing center use UPS. Unfortunately, their battery systems, some of their battery cells were defective. And when, when, a, when a site experience uh, disturbances, the only way that can support the power is if they have UPS with healthy batteries. In this case, the batteries, of course, this is after the system crash, we conducted investigations and the investigation showed there were some defective cells that were replaced. So, uh, my... Okay, where is start video here? Yeah. Thank you, dear. Uh, okay. Uh, no, it's not working. I don't know, something with my camera. Probably it doesn't want to show my face. Anyway, uh, here the recommendations were, of course, we have to put a recommendation when there is an event like this, were implemented including rigorous battery replacement program. We, we, we instituted replacing batteries every three years, as well as we uh, put in place an external battery monitoring system. Uh, because as I said, this event caused quite a bit of uh, business interruption. Next slide, please. What is interesting here, you can see two voltage sag that took place within one second window. Naturally, in this situation, 
this is normally caused by what we call it in our technical jargon, auto reclosure. When you have on these, uh, by the utility, you have their breakers, electrical devices, and when there is a fault on their line, that breaker will, will trip. And then in order to restore the power very fast to the customer, they reclose. And typically they reclose within one second. And so this is what happened. And then as you can see, there was a second fall. Next slide, please. What I, what I thought I'd share with you, a history of voltage sack that this side experienced over one year. And this is taken um, in, in year 2000, uh, from January to December 2000. So this particular site, which is a data processing center, experienced a total of 23 vaulted sags, 23, which means, as I indicated before, almost twice a year. Next slide, please. What I want to point out to this one with an arrow, the one on June 11, as you can see on the slide, we have it, what we call it, momentary outage. What this means is this site will ex experience total loss of power for less than one second, 833 minutes, and the power was restored. However, the event that took place on June 19 was a prolonged outage, meaning the power was lost, it didn't come back. This site has what we call it emergency uh, generator that will automatically start and support the power. So uh, th that's why in, uh, for the data processing centers, for control rooms and for uh, uh, a UPS is there to support you with, with, with uh, providing you with the power, but for a, for a specific time, typically 10, 20 minutes. A generator can run for hours, even days, if, you're, if you ensure that there is enough diesel available there. Next slide, please. This one, this is what we refer, so this is what I wanted to share with you. This is what I call heart of the press. Look at the date of this slide, August 7, 2020, less than a month ago. This is what we call a momentary outage. This particular site experienced a, a complete loss of power and the power was restored in less than one second. If the mitigation equipment available in this site did not operate, they will have enormous amount of loss of business and potentially even, and then restart. Next slide, please. I thought I'd share with you this one. This was when we have what we call it, look at the black line, the voltage, how it went all the way from the normal value to zero. And this window, and then it came up. If you, if you, if you look at the black line, this window was four seconds. The reason is four seconds. That's, that's how long it takes for the emergency generator to start and assume the load. So during four second windows, this side was in total blackout. Except, of course, for the critical equipment, that's when the UPS batteries support their computers. And once the generator is up and running, they support, separate their, they support sorry, the critical equipment via the UPS. So in this case, everything worked what we call it as design. Next slide, please. Now, I don't know if you remember, if you were around 2003, August 14. In August 14, um, um, on, uh, at 1611, this is, we had what we call a province-wide utility blackout. Complete blackout, if you remember. I am pressing start video. I don't know why I, I, I keep getting messages. I think it's to do with my camera, guys, sorry. I have to continue. Thank you for the tips anyway. Sorry. Now, um, so what I thought, I, I was very fortunate that I was conducting a power quality study at this nuclear station. And I have already installed my online monitoring equipment when this event took place. Basically, if you remember, we lost power for hours, in some cases for days. So I thought this event might be of interest to you where the whole province lost power. Next slide, please. This is uh, the same event captured completely at a different place. You can see almost the same time, 16, 12, August 14, except at this site, when we lost power, their generator started and they have a bunch of generators, all came online, started. 
And this site was supported by the generator, to my best knowledge, more than 24 hours. Next slide, please. Now, so what do we do about this voltage medication issue? How do we go about protecting our plants? There are several ways that we can protect our commercial facilities, banks, data processing center, but it really depends how much of that uh, side we want to protect. The first one suggested here, which is commonly used, we call it uninterruptible power supply, which we normally abbreviate it as UPS. Normally, a UPS is used uh, in most cases for a data processing center because data processing center mostly have computers and those computers require less power. Typically speaking, we're talking about a situation that could be anywhere from 30 to 50 kilowatt up to potentially 200, 300 kilowatt. So the UPS device is very suitable to support this computer load when you lose the power completely or you have a, a severe voltage stop because the UPS concept, it has batteries. So just like your car, when you want to start it, you have to have a battery. Here, the UPS is, has a ba internal batteries in it. And during these disturbances, the device is switched to the batteries that supports the computer loads. The second option, active voltage conditioner, this device does not use batteries. When you don't use batteries uh, for the protection, then the protection duration is very, very limited. The UPS, you can protect your equipment typically for 10, 15, even 20 minutes, depending on the design. When you have an active voltage condition, you're talking about, top of my head, uh, I think less than a second because it doesn't have batteries. However, the advantage of active voltage, you can protect a much larger area. So if you have an industrial site or a facility that is uh, of a very critical service, you can zoom in on a section of that plant that is the most sensitive and install active voltage conditioners. These devices have been around, I'm gonna say, for at least 10 to 20 years. The other option, which I have personally implemented, we call it side, uh, sag through, side, sag right through capability. If you have an important piece of equipment in your plant, like a variable frequency drive, like a large one, that is driving a critical process, a large compressor, pump, and when this, uh, electronic device experience a voltage sag, its control, its control uh, does have enough power in it that it keeps the control healthy so that when the sag or the, when the voltage is restored to its normal value, the control has the smart to know where the motor speed dropped to and bring it up to what we call it pre-disturbance. This one is a very, very specific application and to my best knowledge is mostly used in a, in a, in a process environment. The last one with what we call it plant-wide automatic reacceleration. Consider a refinery that has typically 500 plus motors and then you have this voltage sag or even momentary loss of power. That's a good word, momentary loss of power. What is gonna happen? You're basically gonna lose almost all these motors. Can you imagine operation running around trying to restart these motors manual or even from the control room and they have to be started in a specific sequence it's not up to you a b c d so in this particular case i was engaged where we implemented um, a plant-wide what we call it automatic reacceleration using plc and we did this work believe it or not in 1992 for a refinery right here in ontario and, and it was very successful implementation. Next slide, please. Now, the second issue I move on is harmonics. Okay, this is a subject that I first faced when I was doing my PhD work when I experienced harmonic, and that is from 74 to 78, and it's still around to date. Now, harmonics is a voltage or a current at multiple of the fundamental frequency. In simple language, you really like to see a sine wave uh, in your system, a sine wave. Anything that departs, anything that we call it non-sinusoidal waveform, it means it has harmonic. For example, a square waveform will have harmonics. Now, uh, typically a three-phase static power converter are widely used in the industry and they produce harmonics. They pr produce what we call it uh, 
old harmonic. Next slide, please. So the next slide, please. These are typical harmonics that are produced by a, a three-phase balance, three-phase six pulse, which is the fifth, seven, 11, 13, and so on. The problem with harmonics, they, ha they cause several issues, just like the voltage sag, but this is different. Now, one technique that is widely used in the industry to reduce harmonics impact on your other running equipment is to use what we call it multi-winding transformers. The higher the secondary winding, the more the, what you call it, the more harmonic cancellation. Typically, I'm giving here an example, large adjustable speed drive, 10,000 horsepower. Uh, it, it is a 36 pulse converter that will use uh, an isogen transformer with, second, with six secondary. This way you are able to address or suppress the harmonic with respect to the primary side. But with respect to the secondary side, these harmonics still exist in the transformer winding. Therefore, I repeat, therefore, the transformer design has to be special, has to be special and take into account all these, what, what we call them six pulse harmonic in, in, the, in the transformer. Next slide, please. This is, this standard 519 is widely used throughout North America. This is like the Bible when it comes to the guidelines for harmonics in our industry. It basically, what it says, specify guideline with regard to limiting the harmonic voltage distortion that a utility is required to meet at the point of coming coupling. Now, this standard covers, basically it covers two areas. It places the responsibility on the utility. It tells the utility, what is the voltage quality that it can, it can inject to a customer. So it puts a limitation so that the utility, the onus is on them to make sure that the waveform they are provided is within certain limits. At the same time, it turns around to the end user, it puts another limitation on the end user and tell them what are the current distortion limits that they can inject. Imagine if you have a, a, a river and like a polluters. So if you are, if, 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 if you were polluting, let's exaggerate here, in a, in a lake, then the impact is not the same if you're polluting in a liver. I'm not suggesting you go around and polluting, but I'm just giving you a sense here about the differences between these two. Next slide, please. Typical harmonic issues. Why harmonics are a headache? One of the key things is they increase losses in electrical equipment, possibly, possibly resulting in overheating in transformers and motors. That is one of the common problems with harmonics. If the equipment is improperly designed for what we call it harmonic applications or, or what we call it drive application, then potentially you could experience overheating issues. The first time I experienced this problem was in 1983 when I was testing a drive with a 3,000 horsepower load commutated inverter where, where the motor overheated. And we had to basically rebuild the motor. The other impact of these harmonics is uh, possible electrical resonance. Most plants, they will use what we call them power factor correction capacitor. Some of them, they might go and install drives that produce harmonic and inadvertently they will find that the fuses or capacitor failures, not knowing that in some cases you could have resonance. And the other one, of course, is interference with communication network. Now, reference material. Um, I thought I'd share with you a sample of IEEE references here that really covers the subject I just talked about in more detail. The other area which I did not list here is if you are interested, you could research me and go on my uh, website. I have, uh, my, I have several of my own IEEE paper that go in more details on the, the voltage socks, harmonics, and some, um, some actual example and investigation that I was personally, I personally worked on. Next slide, please. Conclusion. Voltage sag is considered, as I said, the most costly power quality problem in our industry. That's why I thought I'd touch on it today. Now, 
it is really recommended that we conduct power quality study to determine any existing system of normality and installing new equipment. Otherwise, you will face the music if uh, at a later date where you have to do. There are uh, advanced online power quality monitoring, whether they are portable or you can install them there permanently, which you gather information uh, as far as your system performance. Last bullet point, harmonics are produced whenever non-linear load are present, meaning anytime you convert a waveform from AC to DC, DC to AC, or DC to DC, whatever way, then the input waveform and the output waveform will contain some harmonic to a certain degree, depending on the design. Next slide, please. I thought I'd share with a postgraduate student, if any is on the other some activities if they are interested really to, to take it up as their R&D or research project. The active voltage correction equipment, if they can develop equipment that have faster waveform analysis, because for this equipment to work properly, they, they monitor online the condition of the waveform and within milliseconds, they have to analyze that waveform and make a decision for voltage sack correction. And hopefully for a longer duration, depending on, on, the, on the system design they use. The other one, it will help if you have advanced portable or online power monitoring devices with higher resolution that can basically capture pre-fault, fault, and post-fault. And of course, the last one, which is already exist in the industry, what we call it active harmonic filter rather than using passive harmonic filter. The reason I felt this could be suitable to the graduate student because this area combines, combines power, electronic, control, and communication. So I thought it's not just power, this is where that's interested. Next slide, please. Thank you very much and sorry for not being able to see my face and I'll be more than happy to take any questions you have. Thank Thanks. you, Celia. Thank you, Bob. Um, I've, I've met, we do have time for questions, so if there are any questions. Um, I, I have one it question. Looks like Rashik has one, so let's go first with Rashik. Thank you. Uh, well, first of all, thank you uh, very, very much, uh, uh, Bob. And um, it, it's um, an excellent selection of the subject. Thank you. Um, on the data centers, and um, I'm going to do a little bit of commercial here because we adding in a data center um, subcommittee for in the industrial commercial power system uh, yes. group, and uh, certainly they could benefit from uh, that excellent presentation. Uh, but my question is, um, in the has in the mitigation measures. For, uh, in the power supply for modern or more recent data centers, have, have these mitigation measures progressed enough to provide more protection for the equipment within the data center from uh, voltage sags and interruptions? The answer is yes. Thank you for the question. <laughs> Uh, basically, uh, until recently, when I say recently, let's say three to five years, we would use, uh, I'm talking about UPSs here, because really that's the most common piece of electrical equipment that is used for the data processing center for protection. To, you know, to give, to basically again, it's voltage sag. And of course, this side use what we call them uh, transient voltage cell suppressors, but these are intended really to, to protect equipment. Because in some cases, just digressing here, the UPS, because we might have a problem or we take it out of service, we have to put it, what we call it, on the bypass. So the customer is now very reluctant, meaning his computer load is fed straight from the utility. So in this case, what we do, we use transient voltage cell suppressor to protect against any line transient coming from the utility, or most of them prefer to run their internal generator. This way they know the generator itself will not produce any uh, thing. But answering your question, in the last three to five years, what the, there has been quite a bit of um, advancement in the UPS design. They use what we call it uh, multiple, uh, what you call it, uh, modular design. 
instead of having one UPS or two UPS in, in parallel, the UPS internally, let's say it's a, a 30 kilowatt, uh, 50 kilowatt load. So this thing could consist of 10 five kilowatt modules. So if there is a failure within one module, that module can be bypassed and you still have 25 uh, kilowatt to support your load. And typically speaking, you design this UPS so that you have what we call it redundancy. You look at your load, and if your load was, let's say, 20 kilowatt, then you go and buy UPS 30 kilowatt, not 20. This way, if one module, even two modules fail, you still can meet that 20 kilowatt load. So this, this is one way. Still, the common things is the battery. What we have done is we tend to use several string batteries. In the case that we lost the battery, it was extremely unfortunate. We had four strings and each string had one bad cell. Very unfortunate situation. And that's why, and, and plus most of these more, uh, new UPSs have themselves internal battery monitoring system. So there has been quite a bit of advancement. In spite of that, you could have the odd, uh, still the UPS itself require regular maintenance and testing. I hope that answered the question. Thank you. Okay, and uh, are there any other questions? For yeah, I have a question to uh, Bob. Yes, sir. Hi, Celia. Uh, Bob, uh, with the um, uh, exten uh, extensive use of electric cars and the uh, use of um, uh, chargers, yes. which are uh, AC DC converter, uh, how do you see the uh, harmonics in the distribution? system, um, the impact of the wide use of the, of the chargers on the distribution system? Excellent question again, uh, Wallace. <laughs> this is almost like COVID-19, it's hidden. <laughs> the problem is hidden like COVID-19. The bottom line is, to be honest with you, the reason this problem has not surfaced or more visible because there are less users. But definitely harmonics are there. And what you have to realize, most of these, let's call it residential trans distribution transformer, they were built 10, 15, 20, 30 years ago. They were not built for what we call it nonlinear load. What, what, this couple of things could save us here. If it happened that that transformer when it was built is oversized, that which we don't know unless we take a lot measurement on that that will buy us some time but the more customers convert to electric cars hence they require that uh, dc charging which requires of course harmonic i think the answer to your question is stay tuned <laughs> <laughs> yeah for how long um, i i have no idea uh, no idea as i said it depends on the on the usage, but the problem hasn't gone away. The only thing is what is helping us is there are less customers, in my opinion, at least where I live, I haven't seen anybody who is driving an electric car, but I'm, I'm sure um, the problem is there, but not in a, in, a, in a magnitude that will cause a problem for now. Well, could we... Um or is there any work done to uh, manufacture these chargers with um, harmonic sub suppressors that uh, do not feed back any harmonics in the system? Uh, albeit it might be a more expensive uh, units. Well, again, excellent question. I doubt it because at the end of the day, these guys sell chargers and they sell chargers for a specific dollar value. The moment you try to introduce uh, you know, harmonic uh, correction, then you add to the value. And, and to be honest with you, we're talking about, I don't know, these charges five, six, seven, eight kilowatt. So everybody is saying, well, it's not my problem. So, it, you know, so for now, they look the other way. For now, for now they, they, they look the other way. I, I give you a, a very quick example, which is an, here at, the, at, the, at Pearson International, when they converted, let me get this one right, they converted those, uh, um, what you call them, um, when passenger arrived, they basically went to AC drives 
And, but the engineer there was very smart when they went to AC drive. The contractor was complaining that this drive produced harmonic. When I did measurement, I said, no, you know why this drive? Because the engineer who designed this used what we call a 12 pulse configuration. He already was able to cancel harmonic at the load side. When it came to the line side, impact on Pierce International was, was, uh, was quite low. I said to him, you will not have harmonic issues just because the designer was very small. So what you're asking about a concept that the harmonic are captured within the piece of equipment, yeah. which is talk about cost, as you said. Yeah. I'm unaware of that. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. okay. Um, I, I thought I had heard that someone else had a question. Um, uh, just not before the question, Sile, if I can just take one second. Okay. Uh, Bob, thank you for your presentation. It's great, but we need to see you. So I'm going to just make one trial on fly with you. We are trying to solve this offline. So I'm going to send you something right now. And if you can just accept. Um, You're talking to me. Yes. I, I, I receive it. I am saying start my video. It's something with my, I'm very sorry. I don't, I, I don't know. I went and, 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 I, and I bought this fancy ever media camera for this presentation that's the problem i did i did uh, do a trial it worked fine you remember i joined uh, yep. Celia. Yep. i don't know yep. what happened yeah you did unfortunately you did that's why i call myself power electronic more power less electronic i even i was jealous of rashid i went and put my tie and my jacket well i was like <laughs> You may have a voltage sag in your area. So go ahead. You, you, no, I, I was joking with, with Bob. It's, uh, you may have a voltage sag or some... some. <laughs> <laughs> uh, shall I tell you this quick joke? Quickly, sorry. It's, I'll take me one minute. Okay. I have my system on a UPS, small UPS. And, and it, it just happened. I don't know what happened with this UPS. Uh, it, it was given an, an, a, a noise. So my wife's ear is much better than mine. This was at 6.30 this morning. She said, there's a noise coming out from your office. Yeah. So I come in and I see the UPS. When it goes off, it gives you an alarm, my small UPS. So I reset it. She said to me, what did you do to get rid of the noise? I said, you better come and listen to my presentation. <laughs> <laughs> so I can tell you, what was the what was the issue with my UPS? So, okay. but again, uh, hi Mikey, hi dear. Hi Mikey, yeah. <laughs> okay, hey, thanks. I, anyway, I think we're we're coming to the end of our time. Uh, so I would like to uh, congratulate all of the award winners, not just the ones who spoke here today, but all of them. We've heard from six, but there were actually eleven. And I can also uh, say that. For these awards, we received multiple very qualified candidates, and we have a tough time trying to select one winner out of the group of candidates we get. So, and I guess you can you can see that after listening to the lectures today, that uh, that there are some very impressive people in Canada. Um, and uh, if you want more details. Uh, from any of them, including the ones who are not here today, please do contact them. I know that most of them would be happy to hear from, from people if you have questions for them. Um, so, and then for the, um, just, to, just to give an idea of what we consider. Of course, the technical contributions are the first and the biggest considerations in selecting a winner, but uh, we also look at what was the value or the impact of the work that the person is doing? How, how has it helped the world? Um, and again, listening to some of these talks, we can see that uh, these people are benefiting us, all of us, in a great way. Um, and we even also look at how, how is that person, is that individual helping others as well? So if you know people who uh, meet these criteria, please do go ahead and nominate them. We do need to, to have nominations. They're not due till November. You've got till the end of November, but please do nominate uh, anyone that you feel would, would qualify to win one of these very prestigious awards.
And uh, with that, I think we're, uh, we're at the end of our time. And I'd like to thank everyone who spoke here today and thank those people with, with questions as well. Uh, and we can go to Bob's first slide so that we can see him since his camera is not working. <laughs> no, I tried. I don't know. That's mm -hmm. why. I, thank you, Celia. Thank you for all the attendees. And thank you for the conference organizers. So, um, if I may. Yes, sir. On behalf of MGA, congratulations to all the winners. And also on behalf of ITRP Canada, of course. Recognizing our foremost uh, engineers, scientists, technologists, and volunteers is one of the uh, greatest pleasures that we have within IEEE. So uh, I'm very proud of all of you. I see very great contributions, fantastic acceptance speeches. And um, I hope that uh, next year we will have uh, a wonderful lineup again. I'd like to see uh, more women if possible. Um, and uh, we'll see how we can do this. And uh, I would like to uh, issue a call to, call to action. So anybody and everybody who actually has won an award, has been awarded an award today, to make at least two nominations. Yes, please. And if you need help with those nominations, the awards committee is willing to help. Celia is committing the awards committee to help in terms of what needs to be brought together, uh, filling out forms and so on. But the actual nomination has to come from the peers. Yeah. That, is, that is the value that the awards uh, bring to the nominee. That is actually a peer nomination, a peer scientist, a peer technologist, a colleague, a peer volunteer. It's a true peer recognition that makes these awards so precious to us. So again, congratulations to you all from ITP Canada, from MGA, and uh, it's great to see you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, even though we're not there, we have people from across Canada here. That's today. right, exactly, exactly. Thank you very much to everyone. Thank you, dear. Okay. Thank you, dear. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Oh, hurry up. No, still there. Come on. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.